All right, everyone, welcome back to the land of Kev. I am your host and the author. My name is Jeffrey Drum. Thank you all so much for joining me again. All right, everyone, welcome back. And I have an absolutely massive research presentation today that is going to shake the very foundations of the Giza Plateau upon which the pyramids are built. This is episode 131, Lightning, Iron Veins, and Silica Microspheres. If this is the type of content you're interested in regarding the ancient technology of a lost civilization utilizing physics and chemistry, and the function of the Egyptian pyramids and other ancient structures from across the world. This is the channel for you, so please subscribe to The Land of Chem here on YouTube, and don't forget to click that little notification bell so that you do not miss the new episodes that premiere twice per week. Please like, comment, share, and stay tuned if you want to help support this channel and get access to exclusive research and unreleased footage that you will not see anywhere else. Check out The Land of Chem members-only channel and thelandofchem.com if you want to pick up a copy of the book or grab some merch, links in the video description below. If you want to follow me on Instagram, my handle is at the land of chem. Also, don't forget, after you finish watching this video, please go subscribe to our two new channels here on YouTube, Egyptian Trash Cats. For all you cat lovers out there, we just had two Egyptian Trash Cat miracles this week, two different mothers, nine new kittens, videos coming up soon, and Egypt Eats for food reviews. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, thank you all so much for the support. I think that is it for today's intro. So without further ado, let's get right to it. And just a quick reminder, the second 2024 Land of Chem Ancient Alchemy and Ascension Tour is on and bookings are still available. If you are interested in coming to Egypt to see the pyramids for yourself, including special permission access to Abu Sir and a private entry into all three chambers of the Great Pyramid of Giza at night during this epic adventure experience coming up in early winter later this year, please send me an email to contact at thelandofchem.com with the subject line Egypt Tour 3, and I will send you the full tour itinerary and pricing details. Thank you all so much, and I will see you soon here in the land of Chem. All right, everyone, here we go with tonight's episode. To begin, the following article was first brought to my attention by my lovely wife, Alexa, several months ago, and again by fellow YouTuber, Ahmed Adli, who sent me the Salim Hassan book reference that you will see later in this video. This monumentally significant topic will be presented in a sequential three-part series here on the channel starting today with the research of Dr. Robert Schock and the new chemical analysis data that was processed in 2023 as a joint project between the Land of Chem and my colleagues at the Acida Project. Next, we will hit the Giza Plateau in this week's Sunday site visit so we can investigate the features discussed today on site, up close, in person. And the series will culminate in next week's research episode, revealing the function of this entire system. So now, let's dive into this article by Dr. Robert Schock, entitled, Vitrification, Lichtenberg Patterns. The Giza Pyramids Mark the Location of Ancient Lightning Strikes. And I will put a link to his website in the video description below if you want to read this entire thing. Now, today's episode will focus on presenting the evidence as proposed by Dr. Schock and with a new set of chemical analysis data from samples taken by the Acida project from these same areas of the Giza Plateau. This excerpt here summarizes the concepts from Schock. First, I am convinced that the Giza Plateau is one location where plasma from this solar event touched ground level. Vitrification, the turning of stone to crude natural glass due to extreme temperatures, can be seen extensively there, and I have studied it for years. It was first brought to my attention by Mohammed Ibrahim and my good friend Yusuf Awian. 
It was during the summer of 2023 that Katie, Schock's wife, noticed Lichtenberg patterns seeming to emerge from beneath both the Great Pyramid and also the Second Pyramid. Her observation was again electrifying to me, and I believe she is correct. Lichtenberg figures, first described scientifically in 1777 by George Lichtenberg, are dendritic, tree-like branching patterns that form when high voltage electrical discharge hits a relatively non-conducting surface, such as the limestone surface of the Giza Plateau. Like many electrical plasma phenomenon, Lichtenberg phenomena occur at scales spanning numerous orders of magnitude, from microscopic to planetary scale or even greater. On the Giza Plateau, Lichtenberg patterns are on the order of hundreds of meters in extent, as they appear to be emanating outward from under the Great Pyramid and the Second Pyramid. Such patterns on such a scale could be due to incredibly intense lightning strikes. However, typical atmospheric lightning that we witness in the present day is not strong enough to create such large and widespread scarring. Instead, I believe what we are observing is the result of a major solar outburst that drove plasma originating from our sun down through our atmosphere and magnetosphere to ground level, where it hit as huge quote unquote lightning bolts. I hypothesize that the pyramids were built on and to mark the center or focal points of major plasma strikes, places, quote, where the sun touched the earth, so to speak, making this a sacred and revered site. These dendritic patterns currently appear as cracks or channels in the rock, the significance of which is easily overlooked. So here, we have the hypothesis from shock that the branch-like formations embedded in the bedrock around the Great and Central Pyramids are quote-unquote Lichtenberg figures resulting from lightning strikes on the Giza Plateau that he believes may be connected to solar outbursts and major plasma strikes. Okay, next. He continues here with some discussion about the Lichtenberg pattern idea, and then mentions here, quote, I must comment briefly on the inventory stela. Discovered at Giza, the so-called inventory stela, alternatively known as the stela of Khufu's daughter, also records a lightning strike. Although the actual stela dates to the 7th or 6th century BCE, it purports to be a copy of an old kingdom text. According to the inventory stela, the Great Sphinx was already in existence during the reign of Khufu, the supposed builder of the Great Pyramid. Indeed, Khufu is credited with repairing the Sphinx after it was struck by lightning. And as you can see here, from the book entitled, quote, The Sphinx, by archaeologist and Egyptologist Selim Hassan, who also discovered and excavated the calcite crystal processing industrial settlement that was shown in the previous Sunday site visit. And I will read a few sections here from the inventory stela, which is of fine white limestone and bears the following inscription. He came to make a tour in order to see the thunderbolt, which stands in the place of the sycamore, so named because of the great sycamore, whose branches were struck when the Lord of Heaven descended upon the place of Horem Aket. If we could believe its inscriptions, we should have to credit Khufu with having repaired the Sphinx, apparently after it had been damaged by a thunderbolt. As a matter of fact, there may be a grain of truth in this story, for the tale of the Nemi's headdress of the Sphinx is certainly missing, and it is not a part which, by reason of its shape and position, could be easily broken off, except by a direct blow 
from some heavy object delivered with terrific force. There is actually to be seen on the back of the Sphinx the scar of this breakage and the traces of the old mortar with which it was repaired. This scar measures about four meters, which accords with the measurements recorded on the stela. The extra damage may have easily occurred at the last destruction of the tail of Nemes. Therefore, it is perhaps likely that the Sphinx was struck by lightning, but there is not a particle of evidence to show that this accident happened in the reign of Khufu. By far, the most interesting part of the inscription is the account of the thunderstorm. It seems to bear the stamp of truth, and it would be interesting to know under which king this event actually took place. The mention of a great sycamore tree having been struck by lightning is also interesting, for there is a similar tree of immense age still flourishing a little south of the Sphinx. So there is textual evidence from the Egyptian dynastic period of lightning strikes on and around the Giza Plateau, including one that may have struck the Sphinx and others that struck the sycamore trees. And this sycamore tree is an interesting side note as these types of trees still exist in this exact same area of the Giza Plateau mentioned in this text to the south of the Sphinx within one of the most highly guarded areas of the entire plateau, the modern cemetery adjacent to Gebel Ghibli that I showed in our Sunday site visit expedition to the Wall of the Crow, which contains sycamore trees. More on this in a future episode. Now, Continuing on with Schock's article here, and I will resume quoting. Giza is not the only site where lightning strikes are associated with megalithic structures. Another example that has been documented in the literature by a team led by C. Richard Bates is the site of the Calanace Stones in Scotland, dating to over 5,900 years ago. And it just so happens that I discussed the Calanace stone circle site back in episode 116 proof of lightning at ancient stone circles when i explain how this stone circle obelisk and conduit system was designed to store the polarized electric field from subterranean to lurid currents on the surface of the ground to attract lightning strikes and distribute that current along the Stone Avenue conduits, just as I explained in the recent episode 130, the Sphinx Avenue voltage transformer system. So now all of the pieces are coming together, but there's more from Dr. Shock's article here. And I will continue quoting, lightning versus hydrothermal mineralization. One critic of this hypothesis regarding the Lichtenberg figures and solar flares has suggested that we are looking at intrusive iron-rich hydrothermal deposits, which are often found in limestone and other sedimentary deposits. Briefly, I would point out that one does not preclude the other. That is, in my assessment, both can and do occur on the Giza Plateau. One can observe iron-rich layers in cross sections of the limestone. In any specific case, one must address the possible causation agents and the possible source of heat. Not simply assume everything represents classic hydrothermal features. We should consider various possibilities regarding the source of heat causing the formation of superficial features that follow Lichtenberg patterns on the surface that just happened to emanate from the two pyramids. What is the source of the heat? Did it come from below or from above? The ancient dynastic Egyptians acknowledged and recognized ancient lightning strikes 
and thunderbolts on the plateau. And perhaps they understood what had happened at Giza. So now we are really getting to the bottom of this mystery. The proposition that these branch-like patterns spreading across the Giza plateau are not Lichtenberg figures, but rather that they are naturally occurring bedrock iron veins. So for now, I will say that the most important detail in understanding the function of these features is supported by Schock's statement that, quote, both can and do occur on the Giza Plateau, end quote. And I will add that these two concepts of Lichtenberg figures from electrical current distribution through limestone bedrock due to dielectric breakdown and these naturally occurring iron veins coursing across the Giza Plateau are not mutually exclusive. And I agree that these features were absolutely heated to a high temperature. Which brings us now to the chemical analysis that proves the composition of these Lichtenberg branch patterns and also reveals evidence that these veins were integrated into the function of the Giza pyramid system in regard to electric current distribution from lightning strikes and the chemical reaction processes occurring inside of the structures across the Giza Plateau. So I began working with the ACIDA project team in 2022. And upon my arrival to Egypt in 2023, I also began to study these veins and metallic ore mineral deposits across the Giza Plateau. As some of you remember from way back in episode 75 and in Sunday site visit two, during my first month of living in Egypt. And after the Asida team noticed my interest in these features of the Giza Plateau, it was brought to my attention that there was still a batch of samples taken during their 2010 research expedition that were never processed. So we decided to open the case, both literally and figuratively. And we sent those samples off to the lab for chemical analysis, including these three from the ferruginous veins around the Great and Central Pyramid. And yes, I still have data from 11 more samples that have never been revealed that will be coming up in a later episode. So now let's jump into the analysis so we can see what these branch-like dendritic figures are really made from. All right, and let's start here with the sample taken from the Khufu or Great Pyramid Iron Vein. And I'm not going to read all of the data, but we'll just point out some significant highlights. First here, this sample showing 56.65% iron with this globule certainly looking a lot like melted iron metal. Next, another sample here, 61.25% iron. Next in this sample here, we have 69.31% iron, more iron dense mineral ore, 51.36% iron. Next, this sample here, 77.99% iron. More here, this sample a little bit more complex, and I'll read the full breakdown. We have some carbon, 28%, oxygen, 44%, sodium, 2%, aluminum, 9%, silicon, 7%, potassium, less than 1%, calcium, less than 1%, chromium, 0.26%, manganese, 0.16%, and iron, 7%. So a bit more complex sample here. Next, this from the same sample, but in a different area, now containing 20.35% iron. Another sample here, 61.21% iron. This one here, again, a bit different chemical composition, 10% carbon, 42% oxygen, 16% sulfur. 27% calcium, 
and almost 3% of iron. Next, another complex sample here, so I'll read the full data analysis. 6% carbon, 37% oxygen, less than 1% aluminum, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, potassium, and calcium, about 1% of manganese, and 52.69% iron. Another sample here, 41.13% iron. Another view of the same sample here containing that 41.13% iron. This sample here containing significantly more sulfur, about 17% and about 23% of calcium, 5.71% iron. Another area of the same sample, 51.31% iron. Another area of the same sample, various breakdown, 24.26% iron. This sample here, 43.65% iron. This sample, pretty complex breakdown, also contains a small amount of titanium, 31.8% iron. And the final sample from this set of data, 59% iron. Next on to the veins from the central pyramid. This sample here, 58.78% iron. This one, mostly sodium chloride, 33% sodium, 45% chlorine. This sample here, 48.78% iron. This sample here, again, lots of sodium chloride, 13% sodium, 70% chlorine, and this sample here, a little bit different with mostly silicon at 42%. Next, the second vein from around the central pyramid. So starting here, we have this sample, 46.48% iron. This sample here, containing a various breakdown, carbon 10%, oxygen 53%, sulfur 16%, Calcium, 19%, 0.25% iron. Another sample here with a rather complex breakdown. This one actually mostly manganese, 40.72%. This sample here, good bit of strontium, 40.65% with some sulfides, 14.19%. This sample, 48.12% iron. This sample, 35.13% iron. This sample, 35.39% iron. This sample, again, 30.36% iron. All right, so now that we know the chemical composition of these naturally occurring bedrock, metallic ore veins is predominantly iron, let's take a look at some other interesting elements that have been discovered in these deposits, specifically, from the pits surrounding the central pyramid. And we're gonna look at these ones labeled three, four, and six. So here is a picture of me investigating the mineral ore in area number three. Here I am inside of pit number six, again, adjacent to the Eastern side of the central pyramid, where I discovered this huge iron vein embedded in the side of the pit. And these metallic ore mineral deposits don't just have iron, but also contain a vast array of rare earth elements. As you can see here in these data tables, showing the concentrations of lanthanum, cerium, praseodymium, neodymium, samarium, europium, gadolinium, terbium, dysprosium, holmium, erbium, thulium, ytterbium, and lutetium. But that is not all. We also have metals like tin, 32% in this sample, nickel, 84% in this sample, and lead, almost 40% in this sample, but we also have metals like platinum, 34.97%,
in this sample. Here, showing more neodymium, 30% by weight in this sample. We also have elements like thorium, small percentage here in this sample, 3%. But also, and more importantly, highly conductive metals like silver, 41%. 58% and 70% silver in these samples. And of course, we also have gold, ranging from approximately 8%, 33%, and 37% by weight, to as high as 55.64% by weight of gold in this sample. So these deposits aren't just iron, but branching, dendritic veins of rich metallic ores that also contain highly electrically conductive metals. But that's not all. They also show direct evidence of high voltage electric current transmission and high temperature heating, as discovered in several samples. First, here from around the trial passages on the eastern side of the Great Pyramid. In this sample of the iron ore, the first silica microsphere, a geological formation directly associated with fulgurites or fossilized lightning. More technically, fused silica from high voltage electric current. And next, from pit number four, adjacent to the central pyramid, from this sample area, another silica microsphere. So now we have conclusive evidence that these iron metallic ore veins containing highly conductive metals were directly affected by high voltage electric current. So these branch-like formations are not technically Lichtenberg figures, which chemically speaking would just be vitrified calcium carbonate limestone, but they are rather iron and metal rich mineral veins. However, as mentioned at the beginning of the episode, these two things are not mutually exclusive, which brings me to the function of these branch-like features and the dielectric properties of iron oxide, as you can see here which is double that of limestone with a dielectric constant of 14. And the structures on the Giza Plateau were precisely placed to integrate directly with these metallic ore veins. For example, the Osiris shaft, as you can see here. From the chamber housing on the second level, the location of which was meticulously selected to tap directly into these thick, metallic ore rich veins deep within the bedrock. And here, you can see this area that was once completely filled with iron oxide. A bit of it still remains up here in the corner. This picture coming from the third chamber housing on the left side of the second level. So the hypothesis presented by Dr. Schock is not too far off, as these branch-like formations are directly related to lightning strikes on the Great Pyramid. But he is just missing one critical piece, the chemical analysis that I have just presented today. But both of these integrated concepts are essential in understanding the overall picture regarding the function of the Giza Plateau pyramid system. All right, everyone, that is it for today's video. This was episode 131, Lightning, Iron Veins, and Silica Microspheres. I really hope you enjoy today's video, and in this week's Sunday site visit, we will investigate on site, up close, in person, these dendritic, branch-like, iron vein formations that spread across the Giza Plateau. If this is the type of content you're interested in regarding the ancient technology of a lost civilization utilizing physics and chemistry and the function of the Egyptian pyramids and other ancient structures from across the world, 
please subscribe to the land of chem here on youtube click that little notification bell like comment stay tuned if you want to help support the channel check out the land of chem members only channel and the land of chem.com if you want to pick up a copy of the book or grab some merch if you want to follow me on instagram my handle is at the land of chem also don't forget after you finish watching this video please go subscribe to our two new channels here on youtube Egyptian Trash Cats for all you cat lovers out there and Egypt Eats for food reviews. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, thank you all so much for the support. I think that is it for today's episode, so I will see you next time. Yo, are you still watching this? Please subscribe to The Land of Chem here on YouTube and click that little notification button. New videos coming out every single week. And check out this other episode. Come on, do it. Do it now.